So I'd just like to welcome everyone to UCC Eric Sock's virtual lecture series, um, which we're now referring to as Back to the Drawing Board. Um, so today um, we have myself, Nia Fairley, who's vice chair of UCC Eric Sock, and we also have Noah Sullivan, who is the guest lecture coordinator this year. Um, today joining us, we have Harry and Cassie from Qualkin Studios. Uh, you might recognize them as they actually gave a lecture last year in person, um, but with um, the pandemic, they have adapted their way of uh, teaching design build workshops. So that's what they're going to be discussing today, but also um, a lot of their projects as well that they have previously worked on. So take it away. Amazing. Thanks, Neve and Noma. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Cassie from Corkin Studio, as Neve said. Um, and this is Harry um, Guys. and together we're, we're uh, two or four of the kind of core team members of Corkin Studio. Um, so at Corkin Studio we aim to create impact through architecture. Um, we're an architectural social enterprise using design and build projects as a vehicle to create a social, environmental and economic impact. So to do this we have three core beliefs at the company. Uh, this is that every human being should have the opportunity and tools to shape the spaces they inhabit. For us, this sort of goes without saying. Uh, imagine the spaces that you use every day and imagine having absolutely no say, no influence on how they work, how they look and how they feel. Uh, the second is that we believe we should all benefit from the quality of life that is achieved through informed design. That feeling when you just go into an amazing or inspiring space, one that just, just works, why shouldn't everyone get to feel this? And the third is that construction has to reduce its, reduce its environmental impact on our planet. Uh, we know you probably all know about this already. Uh, it's very topical and I've probably seen all of the stats and seen the news around the impact of construction on the current climate crisis. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of do this, we um, operate with kind of three pillars. Um, one's designed through collaboration, two's learned through building, and the third one experienced through immersion. So um, the first one designed through collaboration. Um, this means working with communities, NGOs, international participants, and school professionals um, to deliver projects from the start of um, conception through to the handover to the community at the end. Um, and collaboration throughout all of these, these different stages is, is key to making um, it a successful project. Uh, the second one learned through building. So um, we encourage students, local workers and young practitioners to be active co-creators in a vibrant learning community. Uh, so it's important that when we get on site, there's kind of this exchange of knowledge and skills and everyone's learning from each other. So this is the international participants, but also um, sort of young local community members, skilled workers. Um, and yes, yeah, through this, through the process of on-site construction, we facilitate an exchange of that knowledge um, to create innovative design and build solutions. And then the third one, uh, experience through immersion. So um, by living, working and building with the communities that we partner with, we establish lifelong relationships and cultural exchanges. So we, it's really important for us. We don't think that there's a, a better way to get integrated within the community than staying with local families and, and getting to know the people that you're, you're building this, this place for. Um, and it's one of, one of the great uh, key things that, that participants enjoy when they come on project with us is, is learning about new cultures and, um, trying new things and, and uh, experiencing new, new places. So yeah, that, that enables us to gain valuable insight into the, the end user. Uh, we all met originally at Cardiff University in our second year of undergraduate studies um, as a bunch of friends who were interested in traveling and, and kind of wanted to do something a bit more meaningful and a bit more impactful. Um, with the skills and, and maybe limited at this point understanding that we'd gained through our university course. Um, we want to do something a bit more than just sit in, in an office in a company making the teas and coffees or kind of getting an internship, not really doing very much or learning very much. Um, so we decided to reach out to a large number, hundreds of charities, NGOs, 
um, youth hostels, whoever would talk to us, um, suggesting that a group of a group of us second year architecture students could come out and build something for them. Um, it took quite a while, but eventually a charity in Cambodia on the island of Karong um, decided they were that they were keen to sort of take us on and, and, and with a bit of a leap of faith um, agreed to, to have us come and build something for them. Um, they explained to us the situation on the island and that the negative impacts of tourism, um, the growing nightlife industry, drugs and alcohol abuse and, and loud music and, and partying had had a negative effect on the kids at the school that they were working at. Um, once school kind of finished up, there was nowhere for the kids to, to learn and to play safely on the island. So that's where the idea for Playscape was born. Um, Playscape is a series of, of play, playful elements or, or playground elements, all centered around um, an outdoor classroom space for the kids to, to do their homework or to sit and chat and shelter um, outside of school hours. Um, to fundraise for this project, um, we used a, a crowdfunding technique. We asked all of our friends and families and anyone who would give us, give us a few quid to, um, towards the project. Uh, and we managed to raise the majority of the, of the funds for it. We were pretty lucky on this project as well in that we reached out to the music artist Caribou, who was doing um, a kind of live online auction or, or sort of um, call for interest for his giant six foot sculptural fish that you can see here on the right that had featured in one of his music videos. Um, everyone was sort of commenting saying, oh, I'd take it to a music festival or I do this, that and the other. And when he heard about the project and, and putting it in the center of this, this classroom or outdoor classroom space for, for the kids of Karong, he thought it was a brilliant idea. And what's more, he decided that he would push forward the idea and market it for us as well and helped us get over the line, raising all of that all of the money that we needed for the first project. Yeah, so for the first project, um, raising money in that way could kind of work, but for us to um, continue doing this and offer it up to a wider range of people, get more people involved, um, there was a need for a more sustainable structure of, of how we operate our projects. So we turned to this model where we identified six key stakeholders um, and they each contribute their own skills and knowledge. Um, they have their own set of responsibilities and we will collaborate together to achieve a successful project. So the first one there is local community. Um, so it's really important for us that they're involved in all design stages from the brief making process, the design process, um, the construction process. They host um, participants on ground with local families um, and they benefit from the end facility and inevitably take ownership of the building. Um, it's important that projects for us are, are requested and approved by local leaders um, to make sure that, that they're accepted by the local community. Uh, the next is our NGO and charity partner. Um, these, this, these, these guys are crucial in getting the local understanding and, and and assessing that impact locally with the community. Uh, we hinge off the uh, experience and um, long-standing relationships that this charity is, has, has, has harnessed through the years of their operation. Um, they have that immersive understanding and contact with the local people and are able to gain or, or have already gained the trust and honest feedback from the eventual end users. They also help us with a lot of on the ground logistics and help us because we, we have to do the majority of our work up front remotely. They're able to go out and find the various parts of, 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 of the site information and analysis that we need to conduct our remote um, surveys and, and brief formulation. And then there's international participants. So that's people like you guys watching and, and you and Neve and Noma. Um, so this, these are architectural engineering design students, um, also graduates and young professionals um, who want to share their knowledge and, and skills from their education um, at university and often um, interested in gaining an insight into different cultures, different way of life, uh, learning from the design and build process, which might not often uh, be possible at uni. So getting on site and learning construction skills, um, it's really great. Um, to have international participants on our projects and, and con contributing um, those skills that they've got. 
Uh, next up are the local skilled workers. So with every project alongside or led by our, our local charity partner or NGO, we identify key members of the community that have um, often a heightened level or professional level of, of, of skilled experience. So whether these be carpenters, welders, masonry um, experts, these are people within the vicinity, within the community that will both have the knowledge and the, the tacit or vernacular understanding within that country and of the local materials to help us make informed design decisions. And there'll also be figureheads within the community that can galvanize the, the, the local village or, or the local people to come and help out on site. We've got our uh, sponsors and donors. Um, so these uh, can be people that provide direct financial support or fundraise um, for monetary donations. Also people that input their pro work pro bono, um, such as engineers um, and any relevant specialist design consultants, um, such as kind of passive design specialists. Then there's also material donations. So in this image here, um, it, it's a picture from one of the concrete suppliers um, that helped us on some of our Fiji projects. So local suppliers can, can often give uh, materials at a reduced rate or free of charge. Uh, so it, we're really kind of grateful for any sponsors and donors that can help us out on our projects. And finally, there's us, Cork and Studio. So the sort of facilitators or, or, or kind of hopefully the people that make everything run relatively smoothly. Um, we make sure that everyone is being listened to and heard and that all of these various stakeholders are able to input their value and are all benefiting from the process itself. Uh, we manage everything from the participants um, sort of recruitment or drive to, 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 to get people on and enjoy the educational course. We liaise with the charity partner and the community um, via that partner and also feedback to the various sponsors, donors and um, pro bono experts that are involved in the project. So alongside um, identifying key stakeholders, we also kind of had a look at uh, the key things that we wanted to um, think about when selecting your projects and also the objectives of the projects that we take on. So there's three kind of key ones here, community-wide social impact, uh, long-term economic impact, and low slash positive environmental impact. Um, before I get onto those, uh, it's important to say that, um, as I said before, all, uh, all of our projects are requested and approved by local leaders. And all, it's also important that we take sensitivity when deciding if we're fit for a project. Um, so we need to ask ourselves, are we best positioned to offer a solution and add impact to, to a project that comes to us? Um, and do we have anyone within our, if it's not us, if, is there anyone within our extended network that is, is better placed to, to help with this project? But if, if we can't find um, you know, ourselves or, or our, our network of people to be fit for this project, then we'll kind of step back and try and help to find somebody else that might be better suited for the project. Um, so back onto these object objectives, the first one, community-wide social impact. So it's important that the projects that we complete in, in local communities are beneficial to all of the community um, within the village or surrounding villages, and that it can um, you know, have impact community-wide. Um, and it's, this could be through the types of projects that we take on, whether they're educational buildings, um, healthcare projects, or community halls. Um, do you want to take the next one, Harry? Yeah, and then we always make sure there's a, a long-term economic impact, so whether this is creating um, an, a stable or, or independent income for the community users, or whether it's actually that part of the, part of the structure itself can be used or, or rented out for economic means for, for the community. Um, alongside this, the economic impact includes um, having a low maintenance and, and cost to the community and making sure that anything that needs to be done is is within the realms of their sort of um, is, is attainable within their own means. And then the last one is low or positive environmental impact. So it's important for us to work with materials that are sourced or produced locally to the site um, or contribute to a circular economy. So in this image here, um, we'll speak about it later, but there was uh, reclaimed and re recycled materials used on our project uh, at the hive mine in the Eden project. 
also um, important for us to work on briefs that might have a particular um, environmental impact or issue highlighted within the kind of initial um, goal of the project. And then on to um, increasing scale and complexity. So after identifying our key stakeholders and our project selection uh, criteria and objectives, um, We'd completed the first playground in uh, Cambodia that Harry spoke of, also did two more similar playgrounds in Indonesia following that. And those kind of first couple of projects allowed us to progress even more and build, a, build up a bit of a portfolio, um, build on experience and give us a better sense of direction for what we wanted to do moving forward. Um, so yeah, we wanted to increase the scale and complexity of our projects, which meant searching and reaching out to more charities. Um, and we heard back from Nanganga Giving Foundation, which is a, a charity in Fiji. And um, this was back in 2017. We, we worked on two projects that year. Um, so the first one is the, the images that you can see here, um, Noeni Kindergarten. And then uh, there was also a community hall project in Vivili, which is about an hour away. Um, so these projects were a real step up from our previous projects um, and ourselves and the projects definitely benefited from having those established key stakeholders um, identified. Also um, on site, obviously learning from learning on the job a bit, uh, gaining knowledge and experience from the locally skilled workers and local charities that we're working with. Um, and in the run up to the project, spending a bit more time working on um, getting things organized, uh, off remotely um, before we hit the ground and so that everything can kind of go smoothly and trying to consider as many things as possible. So there are always considerations that affect any project. Um, some of you will have encountered this already in the working world and some of you, uh, those joys are still yet to come. Um, and with all of our projects, the key considerations, that there are key considerations that have to be made. Um, and although every project is different, some things are always present. Uh, for us, the, these are the main seven considerations that we have to think about that help to shape all of our projects uniquely. Uh, the first is the budget. So as we mentioned before, um, our partner charity or, or NGO, they often have a very tight red line budget. Uh, they have limited resources and all of the money that they spend uh, as a charity or as an NGO has to be put to to as, as, as efficient use as possible and have as much, as much impact as it can. This means that when we're designing, we have to assess every element that we're adding, refer back to the brief that we started out with and make sure that we strip out or value engineer out uh, any superfluous elements that aren't adding value to the project. Um, so we've also got climate. Uh, in the countries that we operate in, um, there are often a lot of climatic challenges. Um, so in the Pacific Islands, there's a lot of issues with um, things like earthquakes, um, cyclones, and uh, issues of high humidity uh, in those places. So it's really important that we adapt our designs and, and look to um, guidelines for what these structures need to be, and also to um, think about how we can improve the way that um, local construction is happening so that uh, we prevent having to rebuild these these structures um, so so yeah that's sort of climate uh, the third of the materials that we use uh, so we we make sure that these are as local as possible to the site uh, many of our projects have had sort of 50 kilometer or less uh, radius for, for for the entire built structure um, this is for two reasons. The first being that that key thus point of sustainability and climate crisis and, and environmental impact. So we try to be as sustainable as we can and, and build projects that have the uh, are as have have the least carbon impact as possible. Um, and the second reason uh, is for the replication by by sort of local people. We want to make sure we're using materials, tools, techniques that are all local to the to, to the site itself and, and local and obtainable for the local people to to then replicate these ideas. Uh, that leads on nicely to skill level. Um, so often people on site, um, international participants might not have a lot of experience in construction um, and that's completely okay. You know, once we're on the first kind of couple of days on site, we, we make sure to teach everyone the basics of what they need to know 
um, with tool induction and things like that. And then also the kind of young community members or local community that, again, might not have done as much um, building work. Um, so we need to, to create a system for which um, unskilled people are able to um, produce and help construct these elements um, quickly and efficiently. So this will often be um, creating portal frame structures. So you can kind of see in this image in the middle here, um, one of the local guys in Vanuatu sitting on, on one of the bars for the portal frames. So with that, we can you know, create one, show, show everyone how you can make one. And then this can be easily repeated for say 10 to 12 different portal frames. Um, and then whilst that's happening, you can have something else going on uh, at a different part of site. So it's important that we, we, cre we create these buildings in a way that can be repetitive um, so that people can utilize their skills um, efficiently. Uh, touching on that as well leads us into time. Um, having multiple or having design and construction techniques that allow multiple processes to be happening at once. Here in 90, it might look a bit crazy, but actually that's just all of the different processes from all of the different sub teams getting on with jobs at the same time. Um, we have a really finite uh, window to get these projects completed and for the size of them, they're done incredibly quickly. So we work on a two to three month schedule often, uh, and this is due to the, the partners having a limited amount of availability, budget and resource, and also quite often due to the local weather patterns. Um, so we, we design and construct in a way that allows say those portal frames Cassie was talking about to happen at one end of the site, whilst maybe the foundations are being dug at another point, stud walls and window framing is being done elsewhere and concrete is being mixed. So all of these things happen at once to allow us to be as efficient as possible with the limited time that we've got. Uh, we also need to consider the information that we receive. So. Um, it's not always sustainable or um, possible for us to uh, go and visit the site in person multiple times before we get there. Um, often we try and visit it at least once the year uh, before to um, make sure that the project, to get a feel for the project that we might be completing the following year. Um, but the information that we sometimes receive whilst we're working remotely um, can be limited uh, and that it might not be easy to find um, this data that we, we find quite easily here in the UK. Um, so often you might get some site photos taken by one of our NGO partners or a community member, and they might take a, a, an image or panorama of kind of 270 degrees of the site and they'll forget to leave, to add that bit behind, which is perhaps a river or a drop um, and that's that's really important when we're building close proximity to these these spaces. So it often means that we need to adapt um, and, and leave a percentage of the design, um, maybe 15 percent undesigned and 85 percent designed so that once we get on site, we can adapt our structures so that they fit with the, the site context. And finally, for each project, uh, the access and and ability to even get to the site is very different. So on some sites, we might be off main roads in, in the centers of quite large towns or even cities. And then sometimes like on this image here, we're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, getting everything in by a fishing boat or, or on other projects, which we'll talk about shortly on the back of four by four trucks, go along dirt tracks. So it's really important that we understand how the material gets to site. And for example, in, in, in this image, um, offloading from a massive ship to a smaller fishing boat and then driving that, that fishing boat through a small reef to get to, us, to, get to the beach. Um, we can't always get huge cross sections of timber. We certainly can't get any machinery or scaffolding or, or cranes or anything like that. So everything is going to have to be done by hand and we need to make sure that we design with that in mind, knowing the amount of people we're going to have on site and what is liftable by that many people and all of the different techniques that we can use, pulleys or other systems to make sure we can get everything built um, due to that, that remoteness of the, of the site itself. Um, leading straight on to that project um, with a, a long dirt, four hour dirt track delivery. Uh, this is our Ranwa school in Vanuatu. Um, so this project was built in 2019 
um, and was brought to us by a group called the Tambok Project, who are working to build back uh, village facilities and, and help help the vill village people get back to their, their normal lives post some pretty horrendous cyclones and the destruction of, of many of the buildings um, around them. Uh, this project, alongside the issue of, of cyclones and, and high winds, uh, from a structural perspective, had a second element to the brief, which was the, the high relative humidity uh, in the area. This meant that for the school and for the library, uh, the books were perishing incredibly quickly uh, due to the moisture, they were just deteriorating and falling apart. Uh, the site itself, as I say, was a four hour dirt track um, on the back of a, a four by four, so up and down hills and mountains. Um, so it's really limited. And you can imagine that on a site like this, there's not really much infrastructure in the way of energy and, and, and direct water and all these kinds of things. So we had to make sure we were designing in a way that was going to harness passive solutions and was going to be very low maintenance and require really minimal replacement or, or, or new material um, as it wasn't going to be possible to get that delivered on a regular basis. Um, so for this, we engaged within our network several PhD students and professors from Cardiff University that were experts in passive design techniques. Um, and we went through various different methods of, uh, of getting to this point. And what we went for in the end was uh, heating up the air and, and, and hopefully, and sorry, reducing the moisture within that heated air um, by using um, black um, uh, metal sheet roofing across the segment of the building that would have the books in the library in. Uh, this combined with um, a, re a removed skin, so the skin being offset from the actual floorboards at the bottom and, and, and a space or almost like a vent or chimney at the top, meant that the air was able to flow in through the bottom and the, the sort of temperature differential between the cold and the hot air, the moist and the dry air, meant that all of this air was taken up and through the, through the top of the building, wicking and removing the moisture as it passed through. Uh, as well as this, we used split bamboo that was found locally on the site to separate all of the books up, as you can see in this image here, uh, to just increase the um, exposed surface area and, and increase the amount of cross ventilation that was passing through the books to, to again, wick the moisture away. Uh, we left a lot of data recording equipment there with the community, which has shown us there's a 20% reduction in the humidity in this space compared to the original classroom itself, which is brilliant. Uh, and in addition to this, going back to the first point, Vanuatu was actually hit in April last year by the, the, the hardest Category 5 cyclone for, for a very long time, causing widespread destruction. Uh, there were only three buildings in the Randwas village that survived, including um, the, the, the school itself, with many people taking refuge and, and using the space as, as an evacuation centre. So having that social impact alongside the uh, educational side of, of the original brief. Next up, we've got Nindy Community Hall in Fiji. Um, so this was one of our projects in back in 2018. Um, this was actually the first project that I got involved um, with Corkin Studios. So as a participant, um, I came out to Fiji. I was at the time uh, studying a semester abroad at RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, so got on a short flight over to Fiji and, and helped them design and build this community hall. Um, so what was interesting about Nindy Village and, and the brief was that um, they have a prominent Meke group, which is uh, a group of Fijian dancers that dances tr traditional Fijian dance. Um, and they also have a, uh, a big choir and women's craft group that you can see there on the left. Um, so that's quite a key source of income for the village, um, having visitors and tourists come to the village um, and buy small things and watch performances. So, um, that added a really nice performance element to the brief. Um, and as well as it being traditionally used for things like um, weddings, funerals, uh, village meetings, um, everything in between. Um, so, so for this, uh, with the design, you can see that the, the shape of the building crescendos out and up towards the village green. Um, so performances of the Mecca can be done on the deck and can be viewed from the village green or alternatively, um, it can be flipped and, and the uh, performances can happen indoors. Uh, sometimes the weather doesn't allow for those outdoor performances. Um, and as Harry said, 
with the Ramas school, um, this community hall was also uh, used as a cyclone, um, as a evacuation centre uh, during cyclones. So the 90 village community hall originally uh, originally was uh, destroyed in Cyclone Winston back in 2016. So this was the, the new hall that was replacing that. Um, and then we went back a year later and found that the, um, as well as being used for the Mecca and crafts and uh, funerals, weddings, uh, meetings, it was also being used two days a week as a kindergarten. Um, so having these flexible open spaces being adapted by the community once we leave is really great to see. Um, the Fijian government has since then offered to, to train the, one of the teachers. Uh, so one of, sorry, train, give teacher training to one of the local villages um, so that they can become fully qualified and run the kindy um, up to five days a week. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good to see these unexpected outcomes. And also worth noting that the women's craft group that you can see there on the left, they used to operate out of um, their homes. So vi visitors and tourists would come and buy things from, they would kind of be selling it on the green. And now that they've been uh, using the community hall for those sales, um, they've had an increase in, in sales um, since. So that's great for increased income to the village um, as well. Uh, the next project is our Evergreen School in Zambia. Um, at the moment, women make up about 14% of the construction industry here in the UK, and even less in many other countries. Uh, we try to take an active role in affecting change in this area through employing and training local women on our sites. Uh, on this build, um, we had 50-50 male and female local paid employees, both skilled and unskilled. Um, so for that reason, a lot of the, the skilled workers at the time were, were the male employees that were brought on to upskill all of the other uh, full-time uh, local members. Uh, this is also not to mention that over 70% of our participants are female too, um, just by chance, uh, setting a great example to local girls and women in the area. Um, this school itself uh, was built with Mothers of Africa, who are a maternal health charity working on reducing um, infant mortality and keeping young women in school to complete their full education. Uh, so the project was to build four classrooms and a teacher's office space uh, in the uh, village of Chongwei. Uh, the school uh, has been a massive success and has managed to reduce the class sizes from a, around 90 or, or even more per, per teacher down to sort of the, the more, the more um, manageable 20 to, 20 to 25 students per space, which is brilliant. Um, for this project, another sort of unexpected outcome was that one of the local skilled workers uh, we engaged, who is a welder called Freddie, um, throughout the process alongside our participants and, and local material providers and the, uh, the local skilled workers themselves, we came up with a sort of new and maybe um, sort of composite idea for a window shutter system of concertinaing um, shutters sliding up and down a metal rail. Uh, and once we left and, and talked back to, to the charity and to the, to the local end users, we actually found out that Freddie had been uh, packaging this as an idea and selling it within his, as his own new company to local villages and, and local schools around the area. So it was really cool to see this sort of entrepreneurial um, mindset and just to think that something that was a bit, a bit of a melting pot on site of ideas and, and a design resolution that was come to by people from all around the world is now being used for, for Freddie to get sort of an economic income, of, of an independent income of his own. Yeah, so the next one is um, our Hive Mind project, which uh, was one of our first big projects in the UK. Uh, this was completed in um, 2019 at the Eden Project um, in Cornwall, which is kind of a popular visitors attraction that you might, might already know of. Um, so we worked with a charity called the B4 Project, which is a bee charity working to conserve the native Cornish bee. And they were after a beacon project to highlight their shift in becoming a national bee reserve. So we built an observational beehive made from reclaimed scaffolding poles and sustainably sourced timber. Um, the pavilion acts as a sculptural beacon to draw visitors to view the 25,000 bees that live within. Um, so you can see behind, 
well, behind those wooden doors, if you could see, there is um, a live operational beehive. Um, and in the same way as a bee colony acts as a single organism, um, each structural column is connected and dependent on the others in order for uh, it to stand strong. Um, and this is an important project for us in raising the profile of an environmental issue. Um, so the scaffolding poles that were donated were actually donated by the original contractor that was helping build the Eden project way back when. Um, so they donated these um, scaffolding poles. And um, if for any reason the installation was to uh, need to be taken down, then the aim is for, for those materials to be reused in some way. The next project, and this one has probably had the biggest economic impact to date, is our Bula Batiki uh, coconut oil processing plant in Fiji. Um, so we were approached by a community collective called Bula Batiki, which was made up of the four villages and around 300 people based on the tiny island in Fiji. Um, they were looking for a purpose-built space to continue to um, produce the virgin coconut oil that they were making on the island. Uh, at the time, they had sort of realized that due to the increasing uh, effects of global warming, things like farming and fishing were becoming more and more uh, inconsistent in terms of their economic income and um, survival of, of, of their families and, and life as, as they knew it at the time. So they looked at the resources they had available to them locally, and there was an abundance of coconuts on the island. So they decided that one way in which they could potentially monetize this would be to create virgin coconut oil, so something of a slightly higher um, value product, um, and sell that internally within Fiji. Uh, when they approached us, they were actually creating the oil inside the dimly lit homes or community halls, um, and they were completely um, unsuitable for the sort of work that was being done. You'd have men in the corner of a, of, a, of a dark room with a huge machete cracking open coconuts whilst kids were sat watching TV or, or, or having their dinner um, just right next to them. Um, as well as this, it meant that they couldn't reach the hygiene standards that were required to certify the products that they were creating. So they reached out to us and again in 2019, over eight weeks of, 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 of the summer, uh, we took a team from all around the world uh, of participants and equal number of local workers, and we completed the, uh, the, the processing facility. Um, the facility was built um, specifically designed for the, the, the agricultural processes that they were looking to do, both coconut oil and future processes with other uh, raw materials. And since completing the project, um, they've shown a sort of 200 to 300% increase in the amount of sales they've been able to make. Um, this has also been due to getting the hygiene standards required to now sell their community coconut oil in New Zealand and Australia and other international markets, which is great. Um, this is one of the most challenging sites to date uh, with, with having already mentioned it, um, everything arriving on tiny little boats just out of the shot there on the right hand side um, is the very front of the beach and having everything dropped off um, on the, on the beach front there. Um, so a lot of logistical nightmares and, and, designing for pretty specific um, and pretty difficult challenges. So to talk about um, project evaluation, um, it's really important for us to revisit our builds um, and check out how the community are using this space and how the space might have changed. Um, so in this image here, this is the kindergarten that I spoke about earlier, um, the first Noeni Kindy project that we did back in 2017. Um, and the, the, the building was originally made um, as eight kindy students and their teachers were op operating and learning out of um, one of the school canteen buildings, um, which wasn't fit for purpose and it didn't really make much sense. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't benefiting the group uh, in their kind of learning um, times. So we went and uh, built this classroom, which could uh, take up to 30 students um, and obviously it's it's fit for purpose so so we went back and saw the space which has obviously been taken over by 
all the kids and all their work and, and everything. Um, they've really uh, take, taken ownership of the space. But when we went back, there was um, it had hit maximum capacity. So there was it had gone from eight students to 30 students and they were having to turn down um, children from uh, surrounding villages and, and places nearby uh, because they didn't have any space to take on more more children. Um, so we went back in 2019 and created a second classroom. Um, you can see that here. So uh, that's the building uh, in, in the midst of construction. Um, so this could increase the capacity for 50 students um, and they could run two classes simultaneously as well as hire a second kindy teacher. So uh, going from eight students working in the, the school canteen to having two fit for purpose classrooms, um, two hired staff and, and 50 children um, learning is, is a really great outcome which um, was never foreseen when the initial brief was was given to us um, also we we noticed both times when we were working there that uh, the kids parents and teachers would gather under one of the trees um, and take shelter um, and kind of congregate so we when we went back for the second classroom we we uh, constructed this play experimental structure uh, covered space so that um, those teachers and parents could gather under there. Uh, sometimes in Fiji, the weather takes a bit of a turn and it can get really wet. So um, it was it was nice to work on something a bit different um, and also add this play element to add to the the um, playground pieces that the kids had already got there. And then um, just briefly to talk about the impact of our company. So it's great to go and evaluate the projects that we've done individually, but also to evaluate ourselves and the, th the kind of milestones that we've hit and, and check that we're aligned with our objectives and, um, and things like that. So last year we created our first um, impact report, which you can see on our, our website. If you, if you fancy having a look, it's got a lot more detailed information on individual projects and kind of overall um, numbers and figures of, of the company itself. So a few of those key stats are that we've done 27 projects completed, um, 119,080 hours taught on site, as well as 6,000 plus end users engaged. So this was kind of after 2019, we reviewed it in sort of May. Unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, carry out a lot of our projects last year. So we hope that these figures continue to rise and, and keep an eye on those um, as we continue to grow. So for us, what's coming next is, is more work in hopefully in the UK. Um, since the pandemic hit, we had a lot of thinking to do and, and at first a bit of apprehension towards how the future would look for us. Um, with international travel cancelled and projects uh, postponed, we had a lot of internal conversations and, and that was when the sort of impact report that Cassie was talking about was, was put together. And when we looked internally at the company and what we do and how we can drive the standards and ethos that we believe in um, even, even more so. Um, so this also led us to look at the kind of model that we use and how that can be used uh, in a local context. So we believe there's so many issues within the UK, as, as you'll all know, and, and, and in Ireland and in, even in Europe um, that affect all of us and, and affect the people that we know. And we believe that actually the stakeholder community-centered uh, methodology or model that we use is something that should be widely implemented throughout this, this, this context, as well as international development. So within the UK, we're looking to complete more private work, uh, but maintaining our key ethos points of having a social, environmental and economic impact, uh, whether this is done through the people that we employ or the materials that we use. Um, aside from this, we're looking to do more small scale installations, uh, working with charity partners here in the UK on issues such as homelessness, mental health and loneliness. Uh, the rural to urban migration, skills gaps, and, and other areas that, that affect all of us. Uh, it, in addition to this, working on the creative and arts or culture sectors. So we're working currently with a, an arts group in London on a, on a um, pavilion or installation uh, that will raise uh, interest or, or expose the um, issues of loneliness, especially within the times that we're in currently. And finally, we're working with primary and secondary schools across the UK um, at the moment, one in South Wales on design and build workshops to um, hopefully 
uh, champion diversity within within the uh, within the industry. Aside from this, we're working on several competitions, both again in the UK, but also further afield. So we've worked on community based design competitions in the South Pacific. We've worked on craft and heritage competitions in Norway and Scandinavia, and we're working on community engagement competitions and, and pavilion scale competitions here in the UK. Um, aside from this, we work, or, or a lot of these, sorry, we work with um, other students, graduates or small practices that have similar values and ethos to ourselves. So for those that have maybe ideas of, of competitions or, or of projects they want to implement, but as an individual or as a student, you don't feel the confidence or, or that you have the portfolio to back up that kind of venture. We love to partner and hopefully act in collaboration to, to help people realize those ideas. And then the other end of the spectrum on this is that we partner with bigger practices and bigger firms on, on much larger development competition um, entries. And we would engage as community workshop specialists, bringing in the end users and, and, and the local people um, to help that sort of competition have an added um, unique value to it. Uh, the final thing that we're working on um, at the moment as we move forward are our virtual workshops. So as I said, when the pandemic hit last year, uh, there was a lot of questions about how we can deliver our ethos in maybe a more accessible way. So should international travel not be, but not be a possibility, how can we still get our message across and how can we still um, get the things that we feel are important to, the, to, to people that are interested in it? Um, so one of the ways that, we've, that we did this was running a virtual workshop uh, last year over the summer. It was a five week workshop that had over 45 participants from around the world uh, with students, both from first year students all the way up to qualified architects. Um, the, the project was about uh, prototype housing in the South Pacific. Um, and some of the outcomes were, were, were really fantastic to see and some of the ideas and, and seeing the cross pollination of all different levels of experience from all across the world was really, really fun to, uh, to explore. Yeah, so that leads us on to um, the opportunities that we have for 2021. Um, so as Harry was saying, if anyone's interested in learning more about how we run our projects um, and how we set them up, our virtual workshops are going to start in March. Um, so I'm not sure when this recording goes out, but hopefully there's um, a couple of days or just over a week to apply for those. Um, so we've got low tech and passive design in the South Pacific, designing for early years learning in South Africa, sustainable prototype housing in Southeast Asia and designing for circular and resistance in the South Pacific. Um, so they're all um, based and have corresponding construction workshops that we're hoping to carry out this year um, in Vanuatu, Fiji, Zambia and Indonesia. Um, so they're, they're hopefully going to happen from July to September, but obviously they're COVID permitting and we're trying to avoid postponement and being responsive to the situation. Um, but yeah, they're all opportunities that are available for you to apply, apply and join us um, on our website. Um, but yeah, back to the virtual workshops that we're going to start in the next two weeks. Um, it's allowed us to focus on more research based topics and um, it's great for participants to uh, create design solutions and gather information that can better the, the, the real life built projects that we will eventually work on um, and contribute to a larger body of work that um, everyone um, helps with. Um, and then last slide. So if you wanna kind of get in contact with us, um, we're quite active on Instagram. So at Corkin Studio, um, you can send us a message on there and one of our team will get back to you. Or if you want to send us an email, you can uh, send us a message to info at corkinstudio.com. Um, so yeah, that's it. Did you have any thank questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank um, Harry and Cassie for delivering this lecture. It was really informative and it was actually really interesting to hear how you adapted um, during the pandemic times, which we're still in. <laughs> um, Especially because like I've, I've heard of your previous projects, but the fact that you introduced these virtual workshops um, quite efficiently and fast as well was, um, I suppose, it's very indicative of how we're going to start learning and um, developing design now as, as architects and students. Um, 
in response to, um, I suppose, COVID, did you find it very difficult to set these up or did you kind of have a model already kind of set up of it before? Um, so from it sort of being, or from internally understanding that we weren't going to be able to do our international projects to the first day of the virtual workshop, I think it was about maybe four weeks turnaround, something like this. So it, it, it happened pretty quickly. I think a lot of that was due to already having a good understanding of um, the types of workshops that exist. So looking at other people that have done similar, having been on a few ourselves, um, and also having at the time a pretty, or, or luckily at the time, already having a pretty good network of, of external speakers that we could get in, get in. So a lot of practice sort of friends of the practice and, and, and um, critical friends that have helped us to develop and that we've shared sort of uh, speaking um, appointments with in the past. We're happy to jump in and we're really, really believed in the ethos of, of the virtual workshop itself. So showing students and graduates um, different routes into architecture, different ways of practicing architecture um, really, really helped us to, to bolster out the course itself. Um, a lot of the things that we've moved into in those last few slides have actually been things that we've discussed for some of them a couple of years. Um, so there've always been things in the back of our minds that we've wanted to do, but we've just never had the time to, um, to put them into place. And, and I guess the pandemic in, in a way for all of the negative sides of it, that has been a positive aspect that we've been able to, to respond and, and implement some of those ideas. Thank you for that. Um, I think that was quite a good response to it. Um, and it even sounded like um, when you were working on previous projects that you were already delivering stuff remotely to the local builders. So you already had that precedent set up. Um, and I think it's quite an interesting, um, I suppose, initiative to have in place in a studio um, to always just have that kind of idea of how to remote kind of learn and work with the community, particularly um, with one that isn't, I suppose, as easy accessible, um, not even just now, but in general. Um, it's quite difficult to travel internationally. Um, yeah, Noma, do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I, I just got to say, you have beautiful photographs and the buildings are actually incredible. But do you design, like, is the whole design process um, you yourselves or do the people you work with do a bit of the design as well. Um, yeah, so we uh, we always want to kind of engage with as many different people as possible, um, and we like and enjoy collaborating with others. So obviously, it's key that we work with the community and try and get as many community engagement sessions happening as possible. But it's it is difficult. It comes with difficulties in. Um, in getting those set up and getting people engaged and contributing their ideas um, in a in a yeah in a formal in a slightly formal way um, in that it can get back to us and we can take on those um, design ideas and integrate that into the the process and then also engaging with the participants that want to come on our projects so um, we know that we might we might not as the four of us have all of the answers to all of the design ideas so um, making it a very open conversation with the people that want to come on project with us and then also um, yeah giving people a chance to get involved with the design of it just before they they come on our construction workshops because even though they happen kind of through August and September um, a lot of people enjoy I mean not everyone wants to do that um, beforehand but a lot of people enjoy being involved in Things that they can relate to a bit more at university um, in the design sense and then once they get on site they can see how that's fed into the construction stage um, but yeah some people might not have time it's not compulsory but it's optional and we encourage people to get involved if they want to um, so yeah cool. and um do you have any standout kind of interesting stories from your travels like in all these incredible countries you want to go first? I was going to say you go first because last time I think I feel like we said pretty much the same one last time. So I'll let you go first and I'll, I'll have a think. You have a think of your other one. Um, yeah, someone asked us the other day the same question. Um, for me, I think my first project will be, always kind of be really special. Um, and so I, that was the, the 90 community hall projects. Um, 
we really got embraced by the community, which is which was amazing. Um, so uh, a favorite memory that's not so on the construction side of things, but um, on the day that we were the day that I left, we all left on different days. Um, the whole community came in to the community hall that we just built, um, brought the big boombox speakers and were kind of playing loud music. Everyone was dancing, sun was shining. Um, and it was a really emotional time. Um, and and in, in Fiji, sometimes uh, for special occasions, for some reason, um, flower gets involved and you get kind of like this white, they just place white flower on your face and like cover you up and everyone's covered in in white flower and, and um, yeah, running around and just full of laughter. And, and it, that was a really kind of special time standing in a place that didn't exist eight weeks ago is mind blowing. Um, so that's really stuck with me since definitely. Yeah, I think for me, aside from things like obviously all of the the kind of cultural things that you find, all of the the new foods and the new drinks. For anyone who hasn't been to, to Fiji, drinking kava is a pretty interesting first experience. Um, but there's there's loads of really cool things on that aspect. But I think from a kind of uh, maybe just for me, I still find it crazy that we managed to do it. Um, sort of story was in in uh, Indonesia, one of our first projects. Um, we started on the main island of Java in Jakarta and we had to get over to our project site in Bali. Um, we managed to either misalign our, our clocks or phones or, or whatever and, and we didn't get up in time for our flight and we were racing to, in the taxi, racing to the domestic terminal um, and I still to this day don't know how we did it but we got to the terminal with 15 minutes before the flight was set to take off and we managed to get on it. So we were walking up the stairs onto that plane 14 or so minutes later thinking, how have we done this? Um, so that was maybe like a bit of a, a traveling type one. But then um, I think for me, like a way more important one was was the, the project in Batiki last year or year before last now, sorry, um, was when we arrived, there was a young man there who um, called a Seri and he was um, someone who suffered from um, although uh, uh, un, undiagnosed, but from um, uh, a, a mental disability and had been actually taken from his mainstream school on the main island, um, asked to leave due to the, the misunderstanding and, and lack of, 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 of understanding over there with, with, with disabilities. And he was taken out of mainstream schooling and sent back or, or taken back to be looked after by his family in the village. Um, and nobody understood kind of what what was wrong, just that he was different. He's very quiet, very antisocial, um, very kind of scared of us as very different people um, and people that he hadn't met before. Um, and actually, he would always sit very far away from the group or, or, or walk by himself. And he was sort of 15, 16 years old. Um, and gradually throughout the eight weeks, he slowly started coming more and more on site. Um, and started talking to us a little bit more or asking questions here and there or to the point where the, the kind of, again, similar to Cassie, the night before we left or, or even the day the day that we were going to leave, he's, he's helping us on site, tidying stuff up, leading areas of the build, hammering, nailing, screwing, all those kinds of things. And he's chatting to us off site about his favorite movies. And before we left, he's coming over saying goodbye. And I think just that, that was just a real moment of seeing like really visibly seeing how this process can 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 really change people and really bring bring a huge amount of positivity out of out, out of people and bring people together oh, yeah beautiful story yeah i think um what i've gotten from your lecture is that not only is it very kind of architecturally and design based but it's also to do with the community and how community community involvement is quite important in architectural design. Because um, I suppose without it, it's almost useless in a sense. Um, you could almost argue, I think. And it's quite interesting now that you're starting projects in the UK and how you can, I suppose, bring your teachings from your community projects um, abroad to kind of more, um, I suppose, local 
you'd, you'd almost call it more local now and it's it's a context that you're quite familiar with um we, we'd even love to bring them over here a bit more um we, we tried starting some within the college so it, it, we, we're um, we're getting there but I, I think it's quite interesting um to take that model and then bring it in um to the schools or to the local community definitely yeah I think um there's a lot to be said for it and as you say like people are the center and, and actually the we talk about having impact through architecture and it's not just that the structures themselves and you know the numbers behind them the cost the carbon energy all that kind of stuff it's just the fact that this can be a vehicle or it's just like a um, a part of an ongoing and, and way wider reaching relationship and actually one one structure is isn't the end of our relationship it's actually the continuation and we keep working together um, beyond the building itself and that's something that quite often is lost in in, in mainstream development and, and sometimes architecture too so yeah for sure I think there's a, a really strong need for it in the UK and, and in Europe and, and Ireland and again the partners that we're working with is a view to have a long-term relationship um, and whether that be a private commercial project or, or a public installation type series of projects um, is definitely the cornerstone of, of the kind of partnerships we're looking to make. Yeah I mean it's definitely something that I um, almost got hit in the face with when I came on project was how how little I guess at university my specific projects weren't able to engage with the community just because they're often fictional or they're not a real project or site it depends which university you go to and what projects you do but um, when I once I got back from project I definitely thought well anything that I create needs to be for you know needs to engage with who it's for um, and so we definitely encourage universities to do projects that are that involve that community um, and uh, and uh, that's great if anyone wants to come on our projects to to see uh, that different side it kind of awakes you into what who who are these buildings for and what what, what, what who are the people that are eventually going to be in those spaces um so yeah that's uh, that's a great kind of fresh perspective of architecture when you're learning um which was was good to to experience on projects Great, thank you for that. Um, well, we're already getting a notification that we're running up as well. <laughs> um, again, I I don't I well if there's any more questions. Um, oh, for sure. Good. Um, well, thank you um, for participating in our lecture series this semester, and um, we look forward to keeping up to date with what you actually end up doing and hopefully your projects in 2021 will come to fruition and also I'm sure you'll adapt because um, you seem to be pretty pretty good at adapting your studio <laughs> to any sort of circumstance whether it be a, a cyclone or um, a pandemic uh, it, you seem to pretty much be still standing and lasting quite well and prospering um, so thank you um, for joining us. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any final words to say, but... Um... No, definitely thank you for coming and talking to us. Like, it's a big kind of learning curve, especially like, you know, just being in first year, seeing what can, what can be done even while still going through the, the uh, education system. So, yeah, it definitely helps, I'd say. No Thanks problem. for having us. Yeah. yeah, thank you for having us and good luck with the series. And if if people do have questions or want to come on projects or want to start their own projects, please do get in touch. We're, uh, we're, we're a pretty friendly bunch, so we're happy to talk about anything that, that people are interested in. Yeah, no, it's been a great, great conversation. It's been a good lecture. Um, so, yeah, good luck with your studies. Um, hope you all keep safe and well. <laughs> <laughs>